look at Daniel Jeremiah's latest top 50. Big friend of the podcast. He's got Trevor Lawrence at one, Kyle Pitts, number two. Remember, factoring in just like regardless of position, I think a little bit is in this. Looking at the best players in the draft, Kyle Pitts at two. Jamar Chase is the wide receiver one at number three overall, just ahead of Zach Wilson at four. Jalen Waddell, wide receiver two, ranking at five for Daniel Jeremiah. And then Devontae Smith right after at six, right after Jalen Waddell, wide receiver three. Where I want to start the conversation is he has Trey Lance as the seventh best player in this class and ahead of Justin Fields, who comes in at eight, and Mac Jones, who comes in at 32 on his rankings. I know you recently moved Mac Jones up our board Mm -hmm. to around 13 in that 13 range. He has comment on Lance over Fields and then also comment on the gap between Lance, Fields, Wilson Lawrence, and Mac Jones. If you're just doing pure talent, and this is kind of what he talked about, Daniel, when he was on the show before the season. It's like... That's how big the gap is in terms of physical talent. It is that big. It's probably bigger. But you're still like it's still a performance based position to a to a big degree. You still gotta go out and a lot of it ninety five ish percent is done between the temples. So I, I am a bit surprised by that, but but he's five, fifth on our board too. And more of the reason him being thirteenth on our board is because we're factoring in that positional value. Mm-hmm. The fact that quarterback on rookie deal is so valuable that if you just get average performance in the NFL and like you think about any other position say a running back you get an average running back that's that guy's going to be 30 seconds like it's going to be way down on your board yeah if you're just getting an average offensive tackle that's not worth a top 15 pick top 20 pick but the quarterback position how valuable it is that's why we say yeah he's probably 13th on our board is w- worthy of that type of pick because you can get that average production and that's wholly valuable at that position i really do think ha- him having lance over fields and like you said dale jeremiah told us before the season like he was big on trey lance it just speaks to the talent and the ceiling that lance brings to the table like this guy has an insane arm insane athleticism good size and he's not as good as mac jones is a quarterback right now i would say that like mac jones is a better quarterback than trey lance right now but what lance can be or could be in the nfl i think is what puts him ahead of even fields in this situation he has him ahead of fields i wanted to bring this up to you sam monson host of the pff nfl podcast he's been pushing to maybe move mac jones ahead of trey lance on our board what's Mm. your take on that my take is that i completely disagree you're you have a lottery ticket i want to hit the powerball yeah i want at all i want that guy that can win me a super bowl with the roster like the chief's got we don't have to be a complete team but he can get you there i think lance can put you in that sort of area as a prospect so yeah like i said justin fields at eight at nine he has his offensive tackle one and it's been that way for a long time it's Rashawn slater of northwestern coming in at nine patrick sertan is cb1 at 10 micah parsons linebacker penn state at 11 then panay sewell down three spots from the previous ranking he did at 12. And where I'd like to kind of stop next is Gregory Rousseau. Gregory Rousseau right now ranked as his 13th best player in the draft. He's fallen down some boards after what was an objectively rough pro day. He's still edge one for Daniel Jeremiah, just ahead of Quidi Pei, who comes in at 14. Do you imagine that Jeremiah drops him a bit after seeing just the overall stiffness, lack of explosion from Rousseau at his pro day? I don't know. When did this come out, actually? This came out March 29th. The pro day was after that it yeah was it was after Wednesday. that it was definitely so it was after, after that. that i i don't see how you can not drop him yeah. after that it it's one you had a year away from football you're projecting that a guy who's a redshirt freshman at that age will improve physically and maybe this is him having improved physically but this is still not good you read the numbers here seven five three cone at 266 pounds Four four five short shuttle, like the agility drills are very poor. And then the 30 inch vertical jump, the pure explosion numbers, all below average, even compared to defensive ends. We're going to do a full list of winners and losers pro day on Wednesday on that podcast. But man, he's, I mean, you have to put him in the losers because then by comparison, it's who he's going up against. The guy next on this list, Quiddy Pay at 14, rocked his pro day. Absolutely. Jason Noe, all time pro day. His teammate, Jalen Phillips. Every single box ticked, like slotting him in this class and, and going back in the tape. And like, yes, it's very good for a redshirt freshman, but it's not pound the table half to get this guy, even despite a lack of physical tools. So that's the biggest thing to me. The only freaky thing about Greg Rousseau is his frame at mm-hmm. this point. 
I really like Quiddy Pay's edge one. I know that's where you have him right now. And I also think that right after that, if I had to choose number two, it's Jason Owe or Jalen Phillips. Like I really I don't know if Gregory Rousseau is even the number two edge defender for me right now. Yeah. I really like Owe. I really like Phillips. And I know there's I, I'm gonna need a doctor to know if I can even draft Jalen Phillips. I'm gonna need to have that conversation about his concussions. But also, like Azizo Jolari is an interesting evaluation in this class because like he is also explosive in his own right. He had the arm length that was really, and he's already played a lot of good football. You know, he's rushed the passer at a high level yeah. in the SEC. This is such an interesting edge class, man. I don't know. And we talked to Todd McShay, and that interview is coming up later in the show. He says some of the hardest, you know, positions to slot was edge. I mean, hardest players to slot were this edge group. It was that difficult. Did you see that picture of Quiddy Pay also at his pro day? Yes. Looked like a goddamn superhero. <laughs> like he looked like he was wearing a a suit, like the Batman suit. You know, I was like super yeah, yeah, pumped yeah, yeah. up muscles. Like that's what Quiddy Pay looks like. He did 36 bench press reps, like 261 pounds with, with 33 like, inch arms. Yeah, yeah. And then ran a four five two. The guys, like the freakiest drill, he was he tweaked a hammy and couldn't even do. Like he's not pulling out of the three cone because oh, I'm not going to run a good three cone. No, that's the one where he went sub six five last year in the testing. We have the video to prove it. So this guy is just like everything. You want that guy is a monster. Dude, played running back in high school too. Like he yeah. can get so much better in the NFL. And you have such a good base to build off of with yeah. obviously the tools he brings to the table. All right, 15, Elijah Vera Tucker of USC coming at 15 on Daniel Jeremiah's board. Jason Elijah Vera Tucker, just a side note. He's like everyone, everyone's just like guy in this class, I feel like. Yeah. Everyone's just like, oh, Elijah Vera Tucker. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's good. Like mm -hmm. everyone just kind of universally agrees he's good. Not in the Penny Sewell or Sean Slayer tier, but everyone's just like, yeah, he's great. Yeah, he's great. No one has ever come out. No one is coming out and saying Elijah Vera Tucker no one says is a bad good. thing. Yeah. Everyone's just like, oh, maybe he's not a tackle. Where is he right now on That's your board? His, uh, I think he's like 30, just because like guard center, yeah. not as valuable position. Where, where did his arm length come in? Do you know? It was in the 32s, I want to say. Gotcha. Probably kicking inside then. JC Horn, South Carolina cornerback, up seven spots to 16. He had a freaking sick pro day. JC Horn came in and can. Threw up a really, really good numbers at his pro day. Corners all helped themselves. And then, except for Caleb Farley, who comes down 12 Ooh. spots, 217. We talked to Todd McShay about Caleb Farley and the back injury. He said, Todd McShay, I'm going to preview the, the, the interview a little bit here. He said, if you had to pick one corner in this class to cover one receiver on one play of any receiver in college football, it'd be Caleb Farley. It's just the back injuries, obviously the opt-out in 2020, just the lack of what we've seen on film. We haven't seen him play a ton of corner is why he's maybe going to come down boards a little bit. But man, talk about a freakish talent. Caleb yes. Farley, man. Caleb Farley. I, like, and that's the only thing is his. It's his uh, the injury. Like, I, are you going to really draft him over guys who are also quality corners and extremely athletic, like Greg Newsom, like J.C. Horn, like Patrick Sertan? Mm -hmm. If this guy's going to have a hampered, be hampered by a back injury, I just, I think Steve brought up a good point that like the teams with the two first rounders, if he falls to the Jets, and falls to the Jaguars, and that's Balky's mo. You know, that was Balky's M.O. Out, out in San Francisco. He was drafting injury risk guys left and right when they had that roster that was, you know, no needs. We can draft injury guys. None of them ever really worked out. Maybe Tank Caradine kind of had some good years. But that that was that, that makes a lot of sense for those teams, in my opinion. Caleb Farley coming in at 17. Going to move down a little bit with valuing time here. But I wanted to jump to where he had J Jamin Davis, the Kentucky linebacker, up 11 spots, up to 24. We having a little bit of a conversation over the weekend or on Friday about just how big is that gap between Jamin Davis and Micah Parsons? Because I mean, from an athlete perspective, this guy's got the length. He's got the explosiveness. You saw it at his pro day. This guy yeah. can turn it on. What is the key difference? Obviously, Micah Parsons has played better linebacker. He's also played it better for a long time. He's a little bit younger. All those things factor in. But how big is that gap between Parsons and Davis? I still think it's pretty big. The biggest thing being 12 pounds. Like, Jimmy Davis is 234. Micah Parsons is 246. Micah Parsons can go line up, go one-on-one -on -one against your OT if he wants. 234, you're not going to. Like It's just a different body type, that difference at that point. And then, obviously similar levels of explosiveness, but the way Mike Parsons takes on blocks already is it's just different. That's why he's different than a linebacker we've seen you know, since we started doing this. And that's him as that's his soft, true sophomore tape that we're basing that off of. So that to me is why. That's the biggest difference. I think it's still a pretty big gap, but too. yeah, Davis is, he calls him a day one player. I, would not surprise me because that's what everyone's looking for. Four, four speed at linebacker. Everyone wants it. And length. I mean, the guy's got good size, too. Yeah. He's good size, good speed, good athleticism. Moving down a little bit, here's some highlights. Gregory News Greg Newsom, Gregory. Greg Newsom, the Northwestern cornerback, up to 28. Azizo Jolari up 10 spots to 29. Over Jason Owe, by the way, the mm -hmm. freaky talent out of Penn State. Where I wanted to stop, though, was Joe Tryon. I haven't told you this. I talked to Joe Tryon, I think on Friday. 
you know how we've talked about he's like, you know, Levi Muzrike told me he's a completely different player. He looks completely different. Yeah. Apparently, he like recommitted to the kitchen and his diet has completely changed. And he is like the most excited thing he's looking forward to in the NFL is seeing what he does with this new frame. Like he has mm -hmm. a completely new frame than what he had at Washington. I'm interested to see like, cause he's, he's saying- So no Eli Apple concerns here. No Eli Apple concerns. Which were, he couldn't even make himself a meal. <laughs> Eli Apple can't even cook. Joe well, Tryon's, say, but Joe Tryon might, his concern might be he loves cooking too much. No, so it's not cook. He has a personal chef. Oh, okay. Shit. He's had a personal chef in the kitchen, but like he's like completely removed junk food. He was saying that like ah. in the year prior, he was eating Jack the Box, Wendy's, all these different things. It's like when you like factor in what you put in your body, it's going to have some game changing effects. I'm really interested to see what he's going to look like and what he's yeah. going to play like because it's, it, it's, he's talking about it like he's a completely different player. Like he has a completely different frame. All this different stuff. I'm excited to see Joe try him in the NFL. We can also get Eli Apple on the podcast and ask him about it because he's here in, in Cincinnati town. now. Yeah. yeah. So it's Eli, call. open invite. And uh, Annie Apple, yeah. too. Surviving. She's got her own podcast. All for it, man. Coming in at 36, down 10 spots. I mentioned in your take here, Christian Derisaw, Virginia Tech offensive tackle. I think he ranks 17th or in that range on PFF's board. What's the what's the shade yeah, why going people, at Derisaw? People are souring on Derisaw. No, he's awesome. I, I don't get it. Someone's going to explain that to me. Why is he falling on people saying he's falling? He did not test his pro day. Did he have an injury? Is that why? Didn't test sure. his pro day, though. But 6'5", 322. Like he's another one of those big boy tackles. You don't, you don't necessarily have to be the most fleet of foot when you have that size and the power he plays with. I, I, I'm i still unswayed on Christian Derrissaw. Another name to bring up, and a guy that moved up significantly on Daniel Jeremiah's board and the PFF board was Elijah Moore, Ole Miss wide receiver, up 12 spots to 38 on Daniel Jeremiah's board. I think he cracked was, the top 30 on your board, didn't he? I was going to say, some of these guys sneak it in. These are PFF's guys here. So he sneaks in now onto his board. He's got Elijah Moore going up 12 spots. He's got Asante Samuel Jr. going from unranked into 39th overall. He's got uh, Quinn Miners going from unranked to 44th overall. He's the Wisconsin Whitewater interior off lineman. And then Elijah Molden also to make an appearance You're on right. the top 50 also. Those are all some PFF faves. DJ coming around. Love to see it. You love to see it. The other thing he's got too is he had Tutu Atwell in his previous ranking at 36. He's out of the top 50. And I'm not Tutu Atwell peace. I'm not surprised, man. It's crazy. We didn't talk to Todd McShay about this. We didn't have enough time. But like Todd McShay still has him up there in like the top 40, I believe. Tutu Atwell up there yeah, right ahead of or right ahead of, if not... Ahead of Rashad Bateman. Yeah, right ahead of Rashad Bateman. If you have Tutu Atwell ahead of Rashad Bateman, I need to know what's going on. I'm interested. I'm interested. Is it the weight? I see so many people on Twitter, so many analysts talking about Rashad Bateman's weight. How concerned are you? We haven't talked about this a ton. Rashad Bateman coming in at 190. You would like to see him start putting it back on because obviously listed at 210, not just this pat like the last two years he's been listed at 210. Also listed at six foot two. I'm not sure if that's changing. And he was almost six one, is what he checked in at, like six foot and five ace. That's what that's why I tell people how tall I am. Um so we're the same size about I'm about one eighty five. So you're looking at Rashad Bateman right here, is what this is the body type you're Stand dealing up. with. This is Rashad Bateman for you. This is what Peak wide receiver, wide receiver four looks like. He'd never wear that outfit, but sure. Okay, thanks. Um, but <laughs> so cool. we can't be, you can't be outfit. I know, I can't, can't be yeah. outfit policing anymore <laughs> after your history. But oh man, yeah, it's disappointing. But I, I think his game is not completely dependent on that size. Not if you were at one point two ten, which he had to be somewhat close to be listed at that. Usually, you can get back there. Hopefully, with more training after COVID. He said in the interview though, like he played one ninety eight. Like that was his okay. weight. That's when he had his best season. He played at one ninety eight. That's where he wants to work back up to. That's what he wants to play at that's, in the that's, NFL. That's, that's and I like think Stephon that's where does. you want to be. Some other comments here. You moved down the list kind of quickly. I wanted to highlight a few more before we jump to Mel Kiper Jr.'s latest rankings here. But um, Ronnie Perkins down five spots to forty three. We also saw Tom. McShay have him high, I think in the mm -hmm. top 40. Where are you at with Ronnie Perkins? He's I think in the he 40s was too for us. He was a riser at some points and then now has kind of settled into that 40 to 50 range. His pro day was not great. Um I wouldn't call it a faller of a pro day, but I think he ran the four sevens. Um for an undersized guy, you want to see undersized numbers. Like you want to see him be legitimately athletic for even, you know, put up numbers that look like a wide receiver. And he runs a four seven one. 9-7 broad jump, a bad shuttle, actually, 4-6-9 shuttle. 25 bench reps, good length, though, almost 33-inch arms. You can still win. You can still 100% win at those numbers, especially with the way he plays. But in this edge class, you just like there's a lot of guys testing a lot better than he, he did. What I'm finding interesting is also he has Kadarius Tony as his wide receiver four, ranked 23rd on his board, and then a little bit further down, 
He has, um, sorry, scrolling a little bit here. Terrace Marshall Jr. is his wide receiver five at 37. Elijah Moore at 38. And we don't see Rashad Bateman until wide receiver six at 48th on his board. Again, we talked a little bit about Rashad Bateman already, but are you valuing Elijah Moore, Terrace Marshall, Kadarius Tony ahead of Bateman right now? No, I don't think so. There's Bateman's got that solid all around profile that you want at the position. Like, I, I don't really have questions about how he can win from the outside. Now, if you watch this past year, but that is the problem. A lot of it's based off of 2019 tape. This past year's tape, you can justify that to me being low on him based off of what he put on tape this year because he's not doing the same stuff. It's from the slot. Like, he's not, if you watch this tape, you can be unenthusiastic about what he put out there. But I do think tested out well athletically. Obviously, the production is there. There's no real negatives. It was the, the biggest negative right now is that he didn't come in. He didn't weigh in at what we thought, but he also didn't weigh in in a bad way at all. Last comment, comment, comment on Daniel comment. Jeremiah's rankings before we jump to Mel Kuyper Jr. on some of the fallouts here. Davian Nixon of Iowa, a guy that you've been relatively fading compared to the consensus for a while. He's out of the top 50. And then Aaron Robinson, a guy that was like, Daniel Jeremiah, I think, put in a first-round mock draft a couple, yeah. a couple a couple months ago, maybe. And now he's out of the top 50 as well. I just couldn't get on board. I think Tutu Atwell and Aaron Robinson were two guys where it's like size concerns, specifically arm length for Robinson. It's like, I don't know if I'm valuing both those guys as first-round players. And we see Jeremiah kind of jumping on that trend as well. First thing I got to bring up is that I don't think there's a ton of value in looking at the big board itself because it's not factoring in the positional value. There's some interesting things there. We're like we're going to spend too much time. He doesn't reacting. have the cool tiers like or Todd. Yeah, you know, Todd McShay's got the sick tiers. Yeah, man. but I'm going to look at his positional rankings. Going to first start at the quarterback position. Get your reactions to this. Trevor Wait, Lawrence won. Can I have my take on his positional rankings again that I have every time I look at him? Yes, please. The position groupings that he has stink out loud. <laughs> he has. These players all group together in one of his positional rankings. Jeremiah Wusukoromoa, Zaven Collins, and then Joe Tryon are all ranked as outside linebackers. Jeremiah Wusukoromoa played slot in our name. Zaven Collins played middle linebacker, and that's where he'll play most likely in the NFL. And then Joe Tryon played on the edge. And Quincy Roche is in that too, and Patrick Johnson. And wait, Jason always in that one too. They just those are a mess, dude. <laughs> it's a mess. I said and, there's and, not a ton of value in the big board, but here the position. And, and then are one more insane. take. He brings kickers and punters together as if like I kind of respect that. Next kicker or punter on our board. It's like, oh, I need a specialist. Let's go to my kicker and punter rankings. We have to get a better a kicker, but if there's a better punter on the board, half. we'll take him. <laughs> exactly. We have a needed kicker, but if the punter is there, we'll take him. All right, quarterbacks, let's get to the legitimate yes. conversation here. Stop making okay. jokes about Mo Kiper Jr. Just, he's been uh, doing this since about mom. him. I was going to say, he's probably done it these rankings since 1979, and that's why. Yeah. But your mom's prime. Uh, yeah, she would have been 22. Dude, absolute dime. All right, let's look at quarterbacks here. Trevor Lawrence won. Justin Fields, too. As the narrative continues to push Fields down boards, Kuiper says nay. Justin Fields, number two quarterback, right ahead of Zach Wilson at three, Mac Jones at four, and then Trey Lance at five. We've had that conversation on the pod at the top here about Mac Jones and people seeing him maybe as a better prospect than Trey Lance. I know Sam Monson is of that opinion. I think even Eric Eager might be of that opinion. We see it here. But first, Justin Fields ahead of Zach Wilson and then comment on Mac Jones ahead of Trey Lance again. Yeah, the, the Fields-Wilson's the real conversation for me. Fair. That one's tight. And that one's meaningful. Like That is your second overall pick. Um if you're the New York Jets or whoever they may trade to, that one's going to be impactful. And, and they both have their reasons why, how you can see them not succeeding at the next level. So you, you watch the tape and you're like, Wilson's kind of, he's got a little antsiness to his game. He can, he can be late in his own right too. Massive pockets to work with. Fields, obviously, Todd McShay kind of hit the nail on his head with his analysis. He's like, there is slow processing. He used to see a guy open, throw the guy open. Some of that's Ohio State's offense. Some of that's just like field. Some quarterbacks like that. Yep. Yeah. Some quarterbacks do that. That's uh, Ian Book's fucking like that. And he's that's why he's not going to. So we're not high on him because he doesn't. You have love the Ian tools, Book in though. season. Don't start with me. That's not okay. You know that's not true. <laughs> no, for a fact, that's not true. I lament every Saturday that Jimmy Clausen ain't walking through that door anymore. Unfortunate. But, or Brady Quinn. Or Brady. Yeah. Obviously, but. That one, I, like I can, I can go both ways on the fields. Zach Wilson, don't make any jokes about that. But 
I can go either way. Fair enough. All right, let's jump to running backs here. I think an interesting conversation to have. He has Najee Harris one, Travis Etienne at two of Clemson, Javante Williams three, a PFF guy, and then Trey Sorm- Sermon of Ohio State at four, and then Michael Carter at five. A lot of people, including Jim Nagy, Jim Nagy responded to your rankings today oh, saying, yeah. where is Trey Sermon? Why they don't you have Trey this. Sermon ahead of guys like, I guess I think everyone's kind of confident in the top three, Najee Harris, Travis Etienne, Javante Williams. Even though some may be mixed here, I think the consensus is those three guys are the top three running backs in this class. Where it gets interesting is four, five, six, and beyond. You have Michael Carter, I believe, at four. And then at yeah. five, you have Khalil Herbert, who's actually on today's podcast, by the way, who has webbed Jeez. feet, by the way. His left foot has six toes. Three are webbed, three aren't. Factor that in your rankings, Mel. And he played with Puka Williams, who had no toes. Yeah. Lawnmower accident or something. They, just, they had the weirdest running back feet of all time. Mm. Rex uh, Ryan's wet dream. <laughs> that was too low far. Hanging fruit. That was too but, far. Trey Sermon, go. Sermon had a really good physical profile as pro day. He, he is, certainly qualifies as a winner. Four, five, seven is not great. You knew he wasn't a speedster, though. What was great, 37-inch vertical, 10-foot-5 broad jump, and a 6'8", 3'3 cone, all for 215-pounder. That's just kind of that all-around encompassing athletic profile that translates to bring tackles at the next level. It was his calling card at Ohio State. It was his calling card at Oklahoma. He was difficult to bring down. His contact balance was among the best among the position in college football. And so to have those explosive drills and that change direction ability – yeah, I like Trey Sermon. Uh, I'm a fan of his. I, I just don't think he's exceptionally gifted. Michael Carter is, he had elite change of direction drills at 5'8, one or 200 some pounds. Like that, that guy's going to translate in that regard. He's going to be impossible to, to pin down in space at the next level. Khalil Herbert ran a 4'5 at another guy who I, I prefer that 5'8, 5'9 range for running backs. That That is, makes you more difficult to tackle makes you more difficult to find like there's a lot of reasons why it's just the low center of gravity is big and oh by the way he had some pretty darn good testing numbers in his own right at 5'9 210 pounds runs a 446 22 bench press reps his vertical and broad weren't as good as Thurman's 33 inch vertical 97 broad but then he ran sub 73 cone in his own right so he's he's pretty damn good player they're close. And Herbert, too, from a production standpoint, a ton of long runs, a ton of big hitting home runs for Khalil Herbert on his tape, despite maybe not being a 4 3 4 2 type of burner. All right, wide receivers here. D- Devontae Smith at one, Jamar Chase at two, and Jalen Waddle at three. I don't think there's a ton of conversation around who the best three three best receivers are. It's just what order do you have them? What I'm finding interesting is that the consensus is still starting to be. Still on Devontae, though. Still in on him. No, still in on Devontae. So is Sam Monson. No, I think J- <laughs> Sam is on Jamar Chase now. But regardless, we've talked about a lot about Monson on the pod. I think that what I'm starting to see, you saw it from Daniel Jeremiah, you're seeing it here from Mel Kuyper, Tom McShay, I think as well, sees Kadarius Tony, the Florida wide receiver, as the wide receiver four. That's starting to become a consensus among some of the analysts as well. I've kind of faded him a little bit of late, valuing guys like Rashad Bateman over him, Terrace Marshall Jr. over him. Am I wrong to be doing that? It sounds like Kadarius Tony might be the fourth best receiver in this class, according to a lot. I will say, in terms of like size, he's six foot 193. He's got more traditional outside wide receiver size than Elijah Moore shot or not shot, uh, Rondell Moore than the guys who are calling the other slot receivers even Fair. though that's where Kadarius Tony like size wise there's not really much that should be limiting him from playing on the outside I think that's a good comment actually because I think a lot of people including myself and probably wrongfully if you're looking at like my evaluation of him wrongfully putting him as a slot only guy just because that's where he played and I think yeah. he is that kind of gadgety type but you look at it from a size perspective if you're going to come out and say Rashad Bateman can play on the outside you better be ready to say Kadarius Tony can as well is Bateman more polished absolutely but if Tony can get to that level of polish or get at least closer to it I mean you're looking at a guy that can play on the inside and the outside. Jumping to tight ends, I don't think there's a lot of fun conversation here. It's Pitts and then everybody else. I guess Fryermuth as the number two tight end, the guy I talked to recently, wasn't able to do his pro day, battling some shoulder stuff, shoulder stuff, but could be doing some numbers down the road here. Looking at offensive tackle, he does not have Rashawn Slater one. It's Panay Sewell, then Rashawn Slater, Derisaw. He's not fading Derisaw. Then Tevin Jenkins at four. And a guy that I think has been coming up a lot, even Todd McShay brings him up, is Liam Eikenberg, a guy he called a plug-and-play starter. What is your opinion of Liam Eikenberg? I know he's not as high on your rankings. So, I think we touched on this in one of the mailbags. Arm length. He's going to be a guard. More likely than not at the next level. 32 and 3 eighths inch arms. That's very short. There was one, like I said, one tackle under 33 inch arms starting in the NFL last year. So, the rest is very good. I think he's going to be a competent NFL player, but you're talking about... A guard. More than likely a guard. 
Speaking of guards, he has Sam Cosme of Texas, a guy that has prototypical offensive tackle traits and length and size at guard, right behind Elijah Vera Tucker. His guard rankings are Vera Tucker at one, Cosme at two, Aaron Banks at three, Aaron Banks of Notre Dame, and then you have Wyatt Davis of Ohio State at four, and Trey Smith at five. And then another thing here, because you didn't see Alex Leatherwood in his tackle rankings, he has Leatherwood at guard as well. Yeah. A guy that when we had him on the podcast, he said – one of the first things he brought up that teams are telling him they love his versatility. Like they think he can play inside a guard right away. And I'm not surprised that maybe Mel Kuyper is hearing some of the same things and saying maybe Leatherwood comes in and plays really, really good guard out of the gate. Man, he just sees these tackles and guards very different from how I see them. Yeah. Like even projecting to the NFL level. Like he has Eichenberg and Jalen Mayfield, the Michigan tackle as tackles. I, I think both of those guys end up a guard in the NFL. Whereas Cosme would floor me for him to end up at guard. And Leatherwood... Leatherwood, I could see why, but I think he'll stick at tackle for someone. The desperation at tackle is too much. Mm -hmm. Teams need tackles. There's not no one. There's not a lot of offensive lines that have two good tackles and suck. You know? Yeah. Like think about it. There's not. It's not a lot. If you have two quality tackles, usually you have a fairly solid offensive line. Absolutely. All right, going to skip past center rankings here. Not a lot to comment on. Landon Dickerson of Alabama at one. Creed Humphrey of Oklahoma at two. Looking at edge defender here, this is going to be tough because the way he splits these up is interesting because <laughs> defensive ends and outside linebackers, it's like, okay, so he has his defensive end rankings, Cody Pay, then Jalen Phillips, then Gregory Russo, then Ronnie Perkins, then Carlos Basham Jr. Let's stop there. Let's just stop there. I love that. I love that Ronnie Perkins is 253 pounds. He's like 10 to 15 pounds lighter than Joe Tryon, who is listed with outside linebackers. So you go to outside linebackers as Jeremiah Wusu Kormoa is number one, Zayvon Collins of Tulsa at number two, Aziz Ojulari at three. So I don't know where he compares Aziz Ojulari to a Jalen Phillips or Gregory Rousseau. And then he also has, looking more at outside linebackers, he has Jason Owe at four, Chris Rumpf at five. I think we saw Tom McShay, too, have Chris Rumpf at what? Inside his top 50, top 60? Yeah, 60-something, 60 66. So. What's your take on that? Chris Rumpf's a PFF guy, man. That guy wins in PFF system. So Rumpf, interestingly enough, I might have touched on this right, 244 pounds this pro day, but didn't work out. Pounds and that was the weight. biggest thing, is he looked less explosive this year because he was 225 pounds his best year in 2019 when he was kind of that sub-package, joker, defensive, whatever, played all up and down the line for Duke. But he was 225 pounds insanely talented but just can he get to an nfl weight to rush the passer i don't know talk to a kinesiology degree who who does who does frame analysis what if whoever does for frame analysis for i have NFL no idea to see how big guys can get i need to talk to that guy about chris rumpf to know what you can expect him to feasibly get to mm -hmm. weight wise and then obviously maintain that athleticism doesn't test as pro day probably because it wasn't going to be great but I'm a huge fan of his. Just been burned on a lot of undersized defensive ends. It's just not a position that translates well when you don't have any sort of power aspect. Well, he's not a defensive end. He's an outside linebacker. My bad. Okay, yeah. Milton Williams is a defensive end who played all exclusively defensive tackle this year at Louisiana Tech and weighs 284 pounds, but that's a defensive end. Milton Williams is an insane... I was looking at some combine stuff and pro day stuff, and among players that weighed in at over 280 pounds, Milton Williams... Pro day is absolutely absurd. Like it was legendary. It was insane what he did uh, at over 280 pounds. Looking at defensive tackles here, we're going to see some normalcy. Christian Barmer, tack defensive tackle one, as PFF has stated since the jump. Levi Muzurike at number two. Uh, Davian Nixon of Iowa at three. Then we have the two USC guys, Jay Tufele and Marlon Tuipelotu at four and five. Then we start to see some of the big dogs. Marvin Wilson at six, Bobby Brown at seven, Aline McNeil at eight, Tommy Togiai of Ohio State at nine, and Tyler Shelvin of LSU at 10. The more I look at these rankings, the top 10 guys, it's deep because you're going to ask all these guys to do different things. Like you're going to ask, like when you're bringing in a Shelvin or a Togiai or a Bobby Brown, like you're going to ask these guys to do different things. The only thing I kind of hate about it is how low he is on Lee McNeil. Yeah. The the D tackle class is kind of cheeks and, and you're seeing these all over the map because of it. Like there's after Barmore, which Barmore is like one or two for everybody. After Barmore, there's no real consensus on two, three, four, five or anywhere yeah. in terms of even grouping. I mean, you see, you, you have to think that the defensive tackle class is deep at okay players. <laughs> like you see, like, yeah. I mean, like you, you can get an Ali McNeil. It feels get... like last year's tight end class where it's like, I'd love to take one in the fourth. Yeah. 
after Barmore, obviously being one, yeah. maybe the only top 30, top 40 player. Um, going to inside linebackers here. I will say, though, Tommy Togi, yeah, we'll touch on him in the the Pro Day podcast that we're going to do on Wednesday. But, man, he had, a, he had a pretty sick Pro Day. His bench was what, 40, 40, reps? 40 reps on the bench, and then a 7 2 3 cone at 296, which is an elite figure at that size. Man, all right. Tommy Togi, yeah, also a friend of the pod here. Inside linebackers, Micah Parsons of Penn State at one, Jamin Davis of Kentucky at two, Nick Bolton at three, where I find this Bolton one interesting. High. Bolton Hive, Chaz Surratt at four, right ahead of Jabril Cox, your guy, Jabril okay. Cox. And after that, this linebacker class kind of does drop off. McGrone, Cameron McGrone of Michigan at six, Baron Browning, the freaky athlete from Ohio State that you want to go down to either uh, or outside linebacker. It's hard to say. I, have to know oh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe kicker punter. He also, he's probably one of the few guys that's highest on Dylan Moses, having him ahead of guys like Monty Rice of Georgia. But uh, your opinion on Surratt over Jabril Cox and then having uh, maybe Moses that high. Well, yeah, Surratt's completely different level of instincts than Jabril Cox. Plays plays a more physical brand of linebacker than Jabril Cox, but still a worse tackler. Like I, I don't know. I don't know if I trust that those tackle issues are still completely gone. Like that, and, he, and the thing about him, he is old, despite you know being new to the position. Is in his twenty three, sorry twenty three. So there you have it. There you have it. All right. Cornerbacks and safeties. We're not going to go over his long snapper rankings. Not this podcast. Maybe dedicate a whole podcast yeah, to it. But not today. Uh, cornerbacks. He has Caleb Farley as CB1. I think this might have come out before. Yeah. The back. Yeah. The, before the back injury. But still, the back surgery, that is. Uh, Caleb Farley is CB1. Todd McShay had a lot of good things to say about Caleb Farley. Make sure you turn in, tune in to that interview. Caleb Farley at one. Patrick Sertan of Alabama at two. J.C. Horn at three, and then Greg Newsom of Northwestern at four. I will say, you're starting to see a consensus on who the four best guys are. It's yeah. Farley, Sertan, Horn, and Newsom as those four best guys. Probably those four guys that could go or should go in the first round of the 2021 NFL Draft. After the big four, who do you feel like the best cornerback prospects are? Who are your favorite cornerback prospects after the big four? I was going to say, you buried the lead here. Mel Kuyper is the only guy I've seen put Tay Gowan. Oh my goodness, I didn't see that. Has him. Yeah, he has Tay Gowan at 10. He also has he's Sean Wade cornerback. listed at corner, which, I mean, these positionals, yeah. I don't know what to do with these. And he has Elijah Molden who played slot at corner, which yeah, I guess that is, but he's going to be a safety in the NFL world. Let me read the, the rest of his over, rankings, so. and I apologize for that. Tyson Campbell of Georgia at five. No Eric Stokes in yeah. the top 10. T- Tyson Campbell of Georgia at five. Elijah Molden, the slot corner from Washington at tie also for five. five. Oh, wow, he did a little tie for action. Love to see that. Then you have Kelvin Joseph at seven, the Kentucky corner, uh, former LSU corner that transferred. Asante Samuel Jr. of Florida State at eight. Sean Wade, Ohio State at nine. A guy he really loved before this season. Yeah. So I do think that that's a, a product of that. And then Tate Gowan, our guy, PFF's guy, UCF coming in Ten. at number 10. The fifth best one, though, in this class is tough. And that's why I think those guys, those top four, will go pretty high. Because I think after that, I really like Asante Samuel Jr., but he's not going to be for everybody. Yeah. You know, the size thresholds will get, will, will cut him off some team's board. So then those guys just go further down in the draft. But I, I do really think Asante Samuel, obviously Elijah Molden, we call him a safety, but those two guys I feel the best at about being good, just they're not your traditional corner. If you want like a traditional outside cornerback, I still think it's take out. Fair enough, man. Take Allen. He also had a good pro day. It wasn't like elite, but he had a good pro day. I think ran in the low four fours. Low four fours. Love to see that. All right, safety here, and then we'll finish. Um, and we'll jump to the Todd McShay interview, the interview with Sam Cosme, and the interview with Khalil Herbert to finish the podcast. Safeties, number one, no surprise, Trayvon Morick of TCU, best free safety prospect in this class. After that, Richie Grant of UCF, Javon Holland of Oregon, a guy that MGD, MJD said is the best defensive player in this class. I love the Maurice Jones do content. Maurice Jones When's Drew 2.0 content. coming out, MJD? I we need, need Mock Draft 2.0. I need it. I need it. So Javon Holland at three. Then he has Andre Sisco of Syracuse at four. Damar Hamlin at five. The pit Last guy. year, his 2.0 came out at the end of March. What's he doing? Sleep at the wheel. Dude, sleeping at the wheel. Too busy gassing up Javon. My yeah. guy, though. My guy. I'm, a, I'm with MJD. Um, after that, it's kind of... Who's I mean not not a ton of big names in the safety class after Demar Hamlin yeah. at five. Do you, you like see, Cisco though? Do you do you like Hamlin at five? What, where are you at on Hamlin? I like Hamlin. Hamlin and Gillespie are in the early one hundreds on the PFF board, which is gotcha. around safety six and seven, I think. It's this safety class. What's your opinion on the safety class overall? I don't love it, but I do think there are. Oh wow! I just realized he doesn't have Jamar Johnson even ranked in his top ten. Uh, the Indiana guy. So that one's surprising to me. I think. He's safety two on PFS board, but you were late to his tape though. Maybe Mel is too. 
very very possible that I would not uh, be surprised. He's big, dude's barely played. Like, yeah, I mean he had 400 snaps this past year with the most he played in a single season. So the, I, I do think though you have a few all around guys and then a few role guys and then it's kind of cooked. I just don't love the depth of the safety class.